thank you all for joining us for the latest books in focus. We're talking about exciting books coming out in November. I'm Nicole, joined by Patrick and Christine with an extra N. <laughs> we like to start out with some uh, instant bestsellers, some things that you want to get on your radar but already have uh, notoriety around the name or title. These are some fiction instant bestsellers. Uh, the Edge by Baldacci is the second in the Travis Devane series. Sequel to The 620 Man, a small town brutal murder calls in retired army specialist force agent Travis to be. Um, Inheritance is going to be the first in a trilogy by Nora Roberts that's going to follow a family haunted for generations starting in 1806 with Astrid Poole's mysterious surprising wedding day. The Ball at Versailles is by Steele, it's a standalone. Focusing on an unforgettable night in the Palace of Versailles in 1858 that has rippling effects for generations of women all the way to the present. Alex Cross Must Die is the newest in the Alex Cross series. Uh, Detective Cross is in the sights of the Dead Hours Killer, a serial murderer on a ruthless mission. Uh, the Mystery Guest is a sequel to The Maid, which I didn't know was a projected uh, series, but the uh, the maid Molly is back to clean up new dirty truths with her signature flair for cleaning and etiquette, and Detective Stark is back making a mess of things. We've got Iron Flame by Rebecca Yaros, which is the sequel to this year's uh, really exciting uh, fantasy hit Fourth Wing. It takes place in the brutal and elite war college of Dragon Riders. The first year, the Fourth Wing, we did out the weak willed the unworthy and the unlucky, and now the real training is set to begin. Uh, Mitch Album's latest, The Little Liar, takes place from coastal Greece to America during the Holocaust. Main character Nico, 11-year-old Nico, has never told a lie before, and an interesting opportunity presents itself to save his family that upends everyone in his community. Uh, the latest from Michael Connolly is the seventh in the Lincoln Lawyer series. Defense attorney Mickey is back with a wrongfully convicted man uh, to help get him out of prison. He needs help from Detective Harry Bosch in this David versus Goliath courtroom battle. All right. In the world of new nonfiction, we have Einstein in Time and Space. This is a biography of Einstein written by a young science journalist. And this one's a little bit different, sets itself apart from maybe the slew of other Einstein biographies in that it's told in the form of 99 different vignettes uh, featuring Einstein. My name is Barbara. Uh, so in this new memoir, the living legend, Barbara Streisand, uh, tells the story of her life and career. She's one of the Few people to have won an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony Award. And this one is over a thousand pages. <laughs> but I'm sure she has lots of stories to tell. <laughs> then we have Founding Partisans by H.W. Brands. Uh, he's a best-selling historian, uh, finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And in this book, he details the emergence of vicious political division among the Founding Fathers right at the birth of our country. As you can tell from the subtitle, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams all feature prominently. Stephanie Lamb is coming out with a book called Class. She also wrote the best-selling memoir, Maid, where she talked about her life as a maid, kind of living in poverty. Um, there was also a popular Netflix series based on the book. In this new memoir, she, she's writing about her life after the success of Maid, and she talks about uh, experiences going to college, motherhood, and still poverty. Invisible Generals by Doug Melville is the amazing true story of America's first black generals, Benjamin O. Davis, Sr. and Jr., a father and son who helped integrate the American military and created the Tuskegee Airmen. And next we have The Core of an Onion. This is, quote, a delectable look at the cultural, historical, and gastronomical layers 
of one of the world's most beloved culinary staples, featuring original illustrations and recipes from around the world. Dayton Duncan uh, and Ken Burns are coming out with a book called Blood Memory. This one's about the tragic decline and improbable resurrection of the American buffalo. It's basically the story of the buffalo in America from prehistoric times all the way up till today. Another one with illustrations. And then lastly, we have Petty and Booker by uh, Brian Kilmeade. This details the collaborative work towards racial equality of President Theodore Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington, uh, right at the beginning of the 20th century, the era of Jim Crow, um, and their work which helped pave the way for the later civil rights movement. I'm gonna start off with festivities. <coughs> Ann Perry has uh, released her um, released her annual uh, Christmas uh, in her Christmas series. It's a historical mystery. Uh, Mariah Ellison uh, accepts her longtime friend Sarah Sadie's gracious invitation to spend Christmas with her and her husband Barton in their picturesque village. Barton rudely rescinds the invitation, and Mariah discovers that Sadie has vanished without a trace and investigates the sudden disappearance of her dear friend in this chilling holiday whodunit. Will Mariah succeed in bringing Sadie home in time for them to celebrate Christmas together, or is that too much to hope for? So uh, these little mysteries by Ann Perry, they're short. This one, the new one has 208 pages. It has about 200. Yeah. Um, so they're just nice little stories. Let's put you in the holiday mood or, you know, whenever you're ready to go out and get some shopping. And all that. <laughs> so, yeah. um, she's got several. Many authors have several. Debbie McComber is another author who has many uh, popular little Christmas novels that come out a few times a year. Okay, Sister of Starlit Seas by Terry Brooks. This is a fantasy. It's actually the third novel in a series, although it sounds like you could potentially read them separately. Um, so this is an epic fantasy, you could say. It's got kind of a YA vibe. Um, it's set in the world of Viridian Deep. And we have a headstrong, impulsive young fae. If you're not familiar with that, it's kind of like a fairy person. Um, her name's Char. Uh, she wants to escape her loving but repressive family. And she does so by running away and joining a human pirate crew. When the crew's captain, the man she loves, is taken captive by slave traders, she has to leave him to save him, and thus embarks on an adventure of self-discovery. Uh, a couple similar reads would be Uprooted by Naomi, Naomi Novik. This is a fantasy and a coming-of-age story about a, uh, an assertive young woman who's taken to serve an enigmatic wizard who is the protector of their small town um, from the evil wood that surrounds it. And then 10,000 Doors of January by Alice Harrow. This is another story about a young woman embarking on a fantastical journey of self-discovery. After she finds a mysterious book in a mansion filled with peculiar treasures. Next we have Past Flying by Val McDermott. This is the seventh book in her Karen Peary detective series. It's a tense police procedural set during the beginning of the 2020 COVID lockdowns and highlights the investigative challenges that a detective might find herself in during a global pandemic. DCI Karen Peary is the head of Police Scotland's Historic Cases Unit think cold cases. Uh, her latest case begins when a librarian <laughs> finds a recently deceased mystery author's unpublished manuscript that seems to describe the murder of a young woman who went missing a year earlier. A uh, library journal says with an intricate plot, authentic dialogue, uh, rich details, and 
masterly McDermott twists and turns, this book will delight Perry fans existing and new. So a couple read-alikes would be Magpie Murders by Anthony Hurwitz. This is a book within a book mystery uh, in which the main character, who was an editor, discovers clues to a real-life murder in the book, uh, in, in an author's latest manuscript. And then another one would be Raven Black by Anne Cleave. This is the suspenseful first mystery, first installment in her um, mystery series set in Scotland featuring police detective Jimmy Perez. Uh, Grandmother Begins a Story is the debut fiction from a nonfiction writer. And this one is going to be a very original story of drive, power, and healing in a family across five generations of mighty women and the land and the bison that have supported <coughs> their lives. The novel explores a chorus of vivid, funny, wise, confused, struggling characters, including Carter, a recently separated young mother on a quest to explore her heritage, Carter's mother, trying to make up for lost time with her children, her mother, who needs her granddaughter's help, sister Genevieve, who's fighting with inner demons, and great-grandma Mamie is reporting from the af afterlife, overseeing all these stories that began with her and finding ways to help them find their paths forward. So Rita Likes would be a history of burning. A teenage boy in India is taken while looking for work. His survival story will reverberate across his family's future generations. It's an intimate, suspenseful saga. I also picked up this one, Time's Undoing, um, from Cheryl A. Head, a young black journalist searches for answers in her great-grandfather's unsolved murder in segregated, segregated Alabama. Excuse me. Long buried tragedy and family secrets are uncovered in this passionate tale inspired by true events. Philip Marble has the newest one. Margolin. Margolin? We'll go with Margolin. <laughs> so this is gonna, the new one is the seventh in the Robin Lockwood series. I brought the first in the series. If you want to get to know the main character, we have all of them on the shelf. Attorney Lockwood is back and defending her former nemesis in a multiple murder case with too many suspects. Currently, she's a successful defense attorney. Ten years ago, she was an MMA fighter. Her MMA career ended with a concussion from Mandy Kerrigan. Now the roles are reversed, and Mandy Kerrigan needs Detective Lockwood's, or excuse me, Attorney Lockwood's help. Kerrigan's taking the beating this time, and she needs her friend, former uh, foe, to save her. Um, Lockwood doesn't know she's accidentally getting involved with a big Russian mob family case. And in her personal life, she started dating again, which is not always a pleasant distraction. Um, I, this, this series is recommended for fans of Linda Castillo, who like interesting female leads with thrilling elements and layered stories. The Vulnerables offers a meditation on our contemporary era as a solitary female narrator asks what it means to be alive at this complex moment in history and considers how our present reality affects the way the it person looks back on the past. So this is set in New York City during the pandemic. Uh, you have an unnamed female narrator. Uh, she's an older woman who's an author and she finds unlikely companionship with a troubled college student and his friends parent's friend's parent. So what happens is she moves into a friend's apartment to bird sit. The college student is a previous bird sitter who shows up after his parents kick him out. And now they're kind of hanging out together in the same apartment. Uh, it's spare and understated and often quite funny. The experience is less like reading fiction than like eavesdropping on someone else's brain. You have themes of uh, mortality and relationships. A couple of real likes here. First is Wednesday's Child. Uh, this is a, a, a collection of stories about loss, alienation, aging, and the strangeness of contemporary life. And The Rabbit Hutch by Tess Drunke. Uh, this takes place over one weekend, one hot weekend in an apartment building known uh, as The Rabbit Hutch. And it's, quote, a gorgeous and provocative tale of loneliness and community entrapment and freedom. And I believe that one just won the 
either the National Book Award or the Booker Award. System Collapse is the latest by Martha Wells in her Murderbot series. This is uh, book seven. Uh, this, if you haven't heard of this series, it's a very popular sci-fi series right now that features a snarky rogue sec unit, think android, robot. Um, he is the main character and he is the, uh, I shouldn't say he, it is the main character and it is the narrator. Uh, in this later book, in this latest book, Murderbot is experiencing some technical difficulties, right? And its degraded performance is putting its human friends in danger. So while trying to protect a newly colonized planet from a greedy corporation, it has to repair itself before it's too late. A couple read alikes. One would be Persephone Station. Uh, this one's about a community of female and female android refugees who have escaped from servitude and have, have to fight for their freedom against the corporation that wants their property back. And Ancillary Justice is the first in a trilogy by Anne Leckie. Uh, this is another award-winning sci-fi series, also with a non-human main character and I think narrator. Uh, it's about a warship that is trapped in a human body and looking for vengeance. <laughs> I don't think, you know, warship stuff inside the body. I think it's more, you know, like the uh, maybe some computer chips. For Never and Always, one of the few romances we've got to torture you with. In this one, Levi left the love of his life, Hannah, four years ago to explore the world and his budding career in the culinary arts. He never expected to have to go home and work at the inn he grew up in. <coughs> Levi is determined to win Hannah back, show her how he's changed, and he agrees to cook for a wedding happening at the inn only if Hannah goes on five dates with him. A charming set of characters in a lovely romantic setting with small town humor and charm for fans of Alexandria Belfler and Ashley Heron Blake who write similar neat, cute, funny stories, interesting characters with a wide variety of lead characters, contemporary romances. There should have been eight. A chilling thriller set in the mountains of New Zealand. Seven friends are on a long weekend together and someone needs to confess because there should have been eight friends here in attendance. They've been friends since they were teenagers, they're now adults. The characters gather in a formerly glorious mansion straight out of a gothic novel. Some are best friends, some are old flames, some are secret enemies, and some are new lovers. And they all get, bless you, and they all get snowed in. What could go wrong? There's no break in tension as, um, there's no break as tension builds and bitterness and secrets reveal themselves and the truth will be found out on this long weekend. It reminds me very much of The Hunting Party, an earlier book from Lucy Foley. This is friends from high school get together before a wedding or something in Scotland and get snowed in and there's a body. So yes, very much like this one. We'll have to read them to see who did it better. Um, it also brought Jane and Francis Sleep No More up. This is a romantic suspense about a night in a cabin that changes the lives of all the lodgers. They didn't know each other before, but they will now. Again and again. This one sounds like kind of a charming literary piece. I've not read this author before, but he's got quite a few on the shelf. This is a surprising story about love lost, found, and redeemed. Gino Miles is living out his final days in a nursing home. He's bored, a little curmudgeonly. He's not connecting with his new nursing assistant, who is skeptical of his insistence that he's lived not just one, but many lives. Gino claims to have met his true love in medieval Spain and then spent the next thousand years looking for true love again. Who is Gino? A lonely old man clinging to a fantasy or a thousand year old man on a search for his true love. Um, this similar title from his, although they're not in this same vein, but this one sounded familiar. This is um, 2015. 
Uh, this follows septuagenarian Herod, who's reuniting with her daughter, and the two of them confront pivotal events from their life. It also reminded me of last year's uh, The Midnight Library about the main character jumping around and experiencing different things in life. Something about her. The coming of age story from Clementine or Clementine, I don't know if you said it. Taylor comes out on the 7th of November. Um, we're going to meet two young women, Aisling and Maya, as they're going to the University of Edinburgh. And they find a connection that's unexpected when each of them has joined the uh, Poetry Society. The story moves between uh, Ireland, Scotland, and London, and is a story about the fragility and transformative power of first love told with insight and tenderness. It's also described as a heartfelt and delicately crafted debut novel about two young women who become entangled in one another and embark on a surprising journey of self-discovery. And in the same, um, the same vein, uh, Ocean Belongs on Earth Were Briefly Gorgeous. Um, this, he wrote this a few years ago. It's probably one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. He's an excellent, amazing writer. Um, he is a poet by trade, so um, his, his expressions are very intriguing. It's about a young, a young uh, Vietnamese immigrant who um, is writing a letter, the book is a letter to his mother, um, who is illiterate. And um, he talks about the story of him realizing who he is and coming into his own. Um, and there's a very good reason why he writes the story to a mother who will never read it. Um, and then I also chose the house of, the house on Mango Street. This is actually a um, junior fiction but it's been around for a long time, and it tells the story through vignettes also. Um, uh, here in the life of Esperanza, she grows up, um, and she grows up as she's living in the house on Mango Street in the city of Chicago, and she forms friendships, goes on adventures, and fights back against poverty and racism, so it's her coming of age story as well. And this is uh, Rice Bowen. This is book 17 of 17. Now, I don't know if that means she only intends to write 17 in the series, or if it just means there are 17 of them now, so this is book 17. So we'll have to guess about that one. This is uh, Georgie and Darcy back at their estate in Hinesley, and they're awaiting the birth of their first baby and looking forward to hosting uh, their very own house party and introducing their new chef. Sir Mortimer Mordred, a famous author of creepy gothic horror novels, has recently purchased a nearby mansion, and that comes with a very famous poison garden. After a lovely banquet and a fascinating tour of, neighbor, of the neighbor's garden, several of the guests become sick, and one dies, apparently poisoned by berries from the garden. But how could this be when they all ate the same meal and had the same delectable dessert, of course, prepared by the new chef. So Georgie has to find the culprit to save her own, to save her new chef, her own reputation, and all that has to happen before the bundle of joy arrives. So I grab book 16. We need to get in the get in the uh, Georgie and Darcy mood. Um, their adventures are are all over the world, and. Then I also grab Mastering the Art of French Murder. This is a new historical mystery series called An American in Paris Mystery. This is book one by Colleen Cambridge. And this story is a story of a young woman from Detroit who goes to France to spend time with her grandfather. And her grandfather just happens to live in the same apartment building as Julia Child. So she befriends Julia Child and decides it'd be a good idea for her to take the opportunity to learn to cook. Wouldn't we all take that, right? <laughs> um, so they become very friendly, and when she returns to the apartment one evening, to the apartment building, and she finds out there's been a murder in the building, and um, the inspector informs her, Tabitha, the, the young lady, that uh, a note in her handwriting has been found in the dead woman's pocket. 
So this is how we get caught up in this story. Part historical fiction, part mystery, mastering the art of French murder is totally delectable entertainment as described by the Washington Post. Okay, a very inconvenient scandal. They all look, right? Um, this is by Jacqueline Machard, um, who many of us probably were introduced to by the deep end of the ocean several years ago. Um, this is a story um, about Frankie Attleboro, who goes to Cape Cod, which is her home. She returns home to let her father know that she has fell in love, she plans to marry, and she's expecting a baby. <laughs> and her father has some news of his own. He too has fell in love and is getting married and is expecting a baby with her best friend, Ariel. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot to, there's a lot for poor Frankie to sort through here. Um, and as she and Ariel are trying to adjust to their new relationship, Ariel's mother, Carlotta, who's been missing for 10 years, she hasn't been a part of the daughter's life, she returns, I mean, she has changed, but, you know, always the question is, has she really changed? Um, and where has she been? Frankie must untangle the threads of the past to protect Ariel's future and her own. I can't even imagine that. Yeah. So her best friend is not going to be her mother-in-law? Stepmother? Or stepmother, whatever. Step 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 yes. yeah, that does sound very messy, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I just think about my dad and my best friend, and it just like, never have worked. Um, <laughs> and I've also, I've got a new fiction title with uh, a similar um, storyline, which I thought was interesting, but this is, uh, it was checked out. It's the Museum, the Museum of Failures by Reiki Omrigar, um, which is a story of redemption and healing. But this is between a mother and a son. Um, so, it's a tour de force from one of our most elegant storytellers about the mixed bag of love and regret. Also, above all, a much needed reminder that forgiveness comes from the empathy for others. So that's what this one's about. And have, did everyone read The Deep End of the Ocean? Have you remember? No? That was, uh, it wasn't easy to read, but it's a very good book. And she's got many more books um, on the shelf. There's Catfish Charlie, a new book by William Johnstone and J.A. Johnstone, who I believe is his son. Very prolific Western author. If you look at our Western books, maybe 25% are William Johnstone books. So this is a rip-roaring Western adventure. Uh, once famous Texas Ranger who left for a peaceful retirement is lured back into the saddle. Charlie Tuttle had retired from catching outlaws and now spent most of his time catching fish, taking it easy. But now that Frank Thorson and his gang have broken his brother out of jail, killed a deputy and the town marshal, and made off with the marshal's daughter, it's time to saddle up and serve up some deadly justice. So if, uh, if you like westerns of that sort, you, you would probably also like the work of Ralph Compton. Um, this one, Tucker's Reckoning, is about a man at the end of his rope who witnesses a murder and teams up with the victim's niece to see that justice is done. I believe this one is actually, although it carries the Compton name, the author is um, someone else. Doesn't matter, but uh, you get the gist. And this one is Silver Tip Search by Max Brand, another well-known Western author. And in this particular book, a man has to track down a judge's missing son who has joined guns with his oldest enemy. We Must Not Think of Ourselves by Lauren Bronstein. This one is a heart-wrenching story of love and defiance set in the Warsaw, Warsaw ghetto during World War II. 
So 42-year-old Adam Pascal is a prisoner, locked in the ghetto with thousands of other Jews. He shares a small apartment with two families and spends his days teaching children English and working in a soup kitchen. Uh, when asked, he agrees to help a secret group of archivists who want to preserve the truth of what's happening. And this book is written like that's like this is his account that he wrote. Um, and apparently, this is based on an actual historical archives project that took place in the Warsaw in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, now, Adam, while interviewing people about their experiences, he falls in love with a married woman, and he ultimately has to decide whether or not to try and save himself, even if it means abandoning those he cares about. Uh, so, for reader likes. Uh, first off, we have Send For Me by Lauren Fox. This one is a sweeping, achingly beautiful novel that moves between Germany on the eve of World War II and present-day Wisconsin, unspooling a story of love, longing, and the ceaseless push and pull of motherhood. Kristen Harmel has also written um, historical fiction uh, based on World War II. Actually, the book I was going to grab is called The Book of Lost Names. Um, you may have heard of, but this is also by Kristen Harmel, also World War II setting, similar style, similar tone. So the Future is the newest from Naomi Alderman. Her debut was The Power, which was turned into, when the Bailey's uh, Women's Fiction Top Prize was a bestseller, it was turned into a series I think on HBO or some subscription channel I don't have, but I think it had Kate Winslet as one of the main characters, and I always find her wonderful. So check out The Power while you're waiting for the future. Completely unrelated. Uh, in the future, a few billionaires lead the world to destruction and are protecting their own survival and wealth. In the future, um, private weather, private wealth, and high-powered weapons dominate. There will be a cast of interesting characters trying to uh, save the future, including Martha, who leaves her father's isolated compound in Oregon because it's filled with rhetoric, uh, not expecting to trade it for another isolated compound, this time in California, filled with rhetoric, this one disguised as a social media company. Across the world in Singapore, uh, Lei Zen is an internet famous survivalist who's found herself fleeing an assassin. She receives messages on her phone telling her how to escape she doesn't know who is sending them, what they know, and what's next for her. Um, these ladies and more meet up, their worlds collide, their drive and curiosity could either slow down or speed up the end of civilization. I can't promise the writing's as good, but it reminded me of a lot of the themes explored in Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, and then the Testaments, um, interesting female characters forced to survive in a you know, utopian, futuristic, bass backwards kind of society. <laughs> The Manor House is the newest thriller from Gilly McMillan. Okay, in this one, we're gonna meet newlywed sweethearts Tom and Nicole, perfectly average, likable couple, until a massive lottery winning changes their lives overnight. Uh, with their winnings, they move into, I'm guessing it's called the Manor House, it is a state-of-the-art, beautiful custom house on stunning grounds in Glowshire, England. I don't know, but to say I'm hard to say all of a sudden. Glowshire. That's what she said. A lifestyle they could not have imagined quickly follows. Fancy cars and expensive hobbies. This dream becomes a nightmare when a body is found floating in the swimming pool. Maybe not as alone as the, in the country as they had thought. Big money brings big problems and more trouble. Was it an accident? Are they still in danger? I have to read it to find out. Uh, this is her previous thriller. This is a group of women traveling on a remote location in England. They find a startling note saying that not everyone's husband is going to survive the weekend. Uh, the newest from Mary Kubrick would be a great read alike too, just the nicest couple. This is a twisty domestic suspense with a husband gone missing and close family friends were the last to see him before us disappeared. I'll just say, if you have not read anything by Claire Keegan, now's the time. Um, she's quite a writer. Uh, her newest contribution is the So Late in the Day, Stories of Men and Women. This is three short stories.
told in a book that is 128 pages. Um, it is, a, it is uh, stories that brilliantly examine gender dynamics. Each story probes the dynamics that corrupt what could be between women and men. A lack of generosity, the weight of expectation, the looming threat of violence. These are potent stories charged and breathtakingly insightful. They will linger with readers long after the book is closed. Um, small things like these is the one I brought as a read alike. Um, this is, takes place in an Irish town, and it is a uh, your average fella who has an average kind of job. Um, he's a timber merchant, coal and timber. Um, he feels the past rising up to meet him and encounters the complicit silences of people who are controlled by the church. So it too is a very short, um, in pages, but she tells a very powerful story in just, just a few pages. The other I brought, is, as I read alike, is Winter by Allie Smith. This is one of the four stories um, that she wrote, um, so there's one for each season. And she did win or was nominated, I think she was nominated for a Booker Prize for spring, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but her shape-shifting winter casts a warm, wise Mary and uncompr uncompromising eye over a post-truth era in a story rooted in history and memory and with the taproot deep in the evergreens in art and in love. So she too st tells um, very lovely stories and they are not terribly long. And now, moving right along. Okay, now we have some romance coming up at the end of the month. A Demon's Guide to Wooing a Witch by Sarah Hawley. Caladia Cunnington is the heir to one of small town Glimmer Falls founding witch families, and she's cursing the day that she met Astaroth the Demon. But when he shows up memoryless, why does she find him so helpless and sort of hot? <laughs> Astaroth is a legendary soul bargainer who suffers from amnesia after being banished to the Northern Plain. And he doesn't know why a demon named Malak is after him, nor why the muscular, angry, hot, and a terrifying way witch who saved him hates him so much. Caladia vows that once Astaroth is cured, she will kick his ass. But the more time she spends with the snarky yet utterly charming demon, the more she realizes she likes this new improved Astaroth. And maybe she doesn't want him to recover his memories after all. So we follow that, we follow their love story. And this is a previous, um, uh, a previous one by her is um, A Witch's Guide to Fate Dating a Demon. This is as Mario Sparks knows not to trust a demon, especially one that wants her soul, but What's a witch to do when he won't leave her side and she kind of doesn't want him to? <laughs> and then we have from Lana Harper, um, From Bad to Cursed. This is about a young, a young lady, Rowan Shaw, who, who thought she had life figured out until her mother died and a, an unfortunate truth was dropped on her. The women in her family are cursed when it comes to love. Nice short quick books I have. I had no idea. Okay, this young lady, Kristen Rotain, um, she writes a series called um, Green Rider. And this is the eighth book in that series, her new one, Spirit of the Wood. Uh, my notes say it's only 208 pages. I, I don't know. No. But anyway, <laughs> not this one, but yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I, I didn't see the book, actually see it. So this is the, uh, the action-packed feminist fantasy that tells the backstory of fan-favorite character Lauren Mapstone. When she encounters Daryl Riders with vengeance on their minds, Lauren is severely wounded in an attack and must be saved by her young apprentice. An ancient power 
lurking deep within the forest, which they call the Green Cloak, threatens the survival of the riders and or the downfall of Sicoridia and all of the free lands. So she is, she is up against something uh, very threatening in Spirit of the Wood. The reader like I grabbed was Winter Light. Um, this is Messenger, Magic Wheeler, and Knight, Karagon Galadion fights to save king and country from dark magic and a looming war in this seventh novel of the New York Times bestselling Green Rider series. And I also um, wanted to mention, uh, it's been mentioned earlier, uh, because the next book comes out, but The Fourth Wing by uh, Rebecca Yarros. And I didn't even look for it because I know it's out. It's <laughs> always out. <laughs> um, but that is about uh, a young lady who is urged by the commanding general, who is also her mother, to become a candidate for the elite dragon riders. And um, then Nicole shared a brief synopsis of the new one that's coming out, so. Murder Wears a Hidden Vase by Rosemary Simpson. This is the eighth book in the Gilded Age mystery series. So set in Gilded Age, New York City. The characters are heiress turned lawyer, Prudence McKenzie, and former Pinkerton detective, Je Jeffrey Hunter. Um, what happens in this one is a Chinese cultural attache is assassinated at an exhibition of Chinese art objects at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Prudence and Jeffrey are witnesses to the murder and become immersed in the case, and also immersed into a culture that they uh, know very little about. A lot of the action in this one takes place in Chinatown and about them trying to navigate that culture. Uh, I brought Wild Irish Rose uh, by Bowen and Broyles. This is uh, part of their Molly Murphy historical mystery series uh, set in 1900s, early 1900s New York. Uh, and they have a resourceful Irish woman as their protagonist. I also brought A Social Life Guide to Murder by S.K. Golden. This is the first in a series. Um, this one's fairly new, I think. Um, set in 1950s New York, and this one's about a, a young woman shut in who lives in her the hotel her father owns, and she finds herself playing an amateur detective after she discovers a murdered artist in the hotel. A nearby country called Love. <clears throat> this one is set in the contemporary Iran, in Iran on the brink, so to speak. Um, a man returns home to Tehran after being deported from New York City to an apartment. He's returning to an apartment that is haunted by memories of his now deceased father, who was a martial arts instructor, and his oldest brother, a gay playwright, who was always at odds with their father. Um, after a woman lights herself on fire in a desperate act of, defect, of defiance, um, this main character, Issa, is, is prompted to confront his own family history. Um, there's lots of bed hopping, apparently, in this book. And there's complicated friendship with a firefighter named Nasser. It's an artful rendering of hope amid despair. So you have themes of family, toxic mas masculinity, love, and sexuality. Um, I brought as a read-alike man of my time by Dahlia Sofer. This one's also set in Iran and New York City. And in this one you have an Iranian interrogator who examines his life and reconnects with his family after his father dies. And I also brought The Namesake by Yupa Lahiri. Uh, this one has an Indian family trying to adapt to American life while still honoring the traditions of their home country. Beautiful in the Wild takes place during summertime in Alaska. Main character Liv is living. Liv is living. That was redundant. I'm sorry. Liv is staying in a shipping container turned storage shed, but not by choice. Uh, early on twist. So this isn't a big spoiler. You'll get this on the flyleaf, as they say. An early on twist. A man she thought she knew is now holding her captive. And she will do anything to escape. 
If she does manage to escape, she's surrounded by thick forest in the Alaskan wilderness and has no idea where her current location is or how much forest she has to overcome. Liv is with her son, so once they are able to get out, uh, she's still going to have a very difficult time in Alaska. Now, this, the publisher sells it as a story of survival in the wilds of Alaska, but online reviews lead me to believe that there's a lot more setup, there's a lot more family story, there's a lot more about Liv, and then she surprisingly ends up here. There's a lot more build up to the entrapment, and then the, of course, final game of cat and mouse taking place in Alaska. Um, made me think of Thin Ice. This is um, first in a series by Paige Sheldon, who's a very popular cozy mystery writer. Uh, Beth Rivers is the main character in this series. She's a writer. She had also survived being held captive for three days. Um, and Alaska seems like a great place to hide, but her past is going to catch up to her. Uh, off the new shelf, The Couples Trip. There's an annual hiking trip where two couples go camping and hiking together. Uh, this year's not going so well because one of the men isn't who they thought he was in this psychological and wilderness thriller. Murder Beyond the Pale. Promises to be a series with a whip-smart, sarcastic, amateur sleuth to keep your eye on. Jessie O'Hare is currently unemployed but her last employer said she was a million dollar brain with a 10 cent personality. She takes a freelance job, mostly for the trip to Ireland, to help a family with a missing daughter. It sounds like it'll be quick work with plenty of time for drinking and touring afterwards. Um, but soon there's evidence of foul play. The case gets increasingly complicated. She tries not to cross the IRA or the local drug kingpin. And with the growing complications and threats, Jess is going to use every ounce of which she has not to end up the next missing person. Um, it made me think of the main character in this um, Darna Jones series. This is the first one in a trilogy. A Bad Day for Sunshine will have you laughing along with Sheriff Sunshine. Um, she's a sassy detective, takes place in New Mexico. She's struggling in her dating life and in her professional life trying to keep her small town in order. It also made me think of this Scott in a Trap series where the main character is from Scotland. Um, she ends up with a slew of interesting characters at the Last Ditch Motel. The guests and staff are trying to help her solve mysteries. So there's a couple of those Scottish themed ones. Well, eat poop and die. How animals make our world. Um, I messed up your vision. Um, so this is an exploration um, of how ecosystems are sculpted and sustained by animals eating, pooping, and dying, and how these fundamental functions can help save us from climate catastrophe. Um, the author is Joe Roman, PhD, and he says that if, for if forests are the lungs of our planet, then animals migrating across oceans, streams, and mountains eating, pooping, and dying along the way, are at its, are its heart and arteries, pumping nitrogen and phosphorus from deep sea gorges up to mountain peaks from the Arctic to the Caribbean. Without this conveyor belt of crucial life-sustaining nutrients, our world would look very different. Um, this is described as a compulsively readable book that takes her here on exhilarating and enlightening global adventure. Um, so it looks like he's looking at our ecosystems in a unique way. So read the likes that I chose. I chose um, the heartbeat. I meant to grab the, I'm sorry, I meant to grab the, um, hit the lines of trees. Anyway. <coughs> uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, uh, but the, in the, the Hidden Life of Trees, um, author Peter Wolleman, uh, he, ma he makes the case and, and supports it with science that trees are a social system, not just an ecosystem, a social system, that they communicate for, between each other and care about each other. Um, and then Nature's Best Hope, um, 
is uh, uh, Talami is the author, and he lays out all you need to know to participate in one of the great conservation projects of our time. Um, his advice, plant more natives and turn your yards into conservation corridors that provide wildlife habitats. Isn't that radical? <laughs> and the approach, right? The approach, which is a grassroots approach, relies on the initiative of private individuals and is immune from the whims of government policy. So this is where we can start with ourselves in our own homes and make impact within our families and neighborhoods. I'll see you on Mars. And this book is written by Kelly and Zach Weiner-Smith. The subtitle to A City on Mars is Can We Settle Space? Should We Settle Space? And have we really thought this through? <laughs> Um, so Earth is not well. The promise of starting a new life somewhere far, far away. No climate change, no war, no Twitter. It beckons. And settling seems barely within our grasp. Or is it? Space technologies and space business are progressing fast. But we still lack the knowledge needed to have space kids, build space farms, and create space nations in a way that doesn't spark conflict back home. So can you make babies in space? Should corporations govern space settlements? What about space war? Are we headed for a housing crisis on the moon's peak of eternal light? And what happens if you're left in the, cradle, the craters of eternal darkness? Why do astronauts love taco sauce? And speaking of meals, what is the legal status of space cannibalism? So they have taken the their experience, their expertise, and their uh, previous works and rolled it into uh, a, a, a caution moment for all of us to think about. Um, and the biggest, what are we going to do with it, that always comes into my mind, is with the nuclear power movement. Nuclear power was going to be the be all end all save all, we're never going to need coal again, it's the greatest thing on earth until we figured out nobody thought, what are we gonna do with the waste? What do we do with it? So, um, they're, they're, well, yeah, right, and that is just grown and grown and grown, that, that can question. Can we mess up another planet? Can we, yeah, how many more, how many more can we mess up? So, there are a lot of practical, um, are a lot of practical questions that they take on. Um, and then, as Rita likes, I brought their, this is Soonish, is, uh, is their previous book. Um, and they are looking at future technologies, uh, things from um, traveling in deep space to 3D organ printing, so these things that are seem, seem to be on our horizon. And they wonder what does, what will the world look like and how does progress happen and why do we not have a lunar colony already and what is the holdup? So it's just talking about the steps that um, even great progress doesn't happen necessarily quickly. And another book uh, is a read alike, How to Astronaut. This is uh, by Terry Burtz. He is an astronaut. And we are invited to ride shotgun with him on a trip into space. He is a storyteller with a gift for the surprising turn of phrase and an eye for the perfect you are there details captures all the highs, lows, humor, and wonder of an experience few will ever know firsthand. So we cover several topics, and that makes it all very accessible. <coughs> the next selection, Invitation to a Banquet, the Story of Chinese Food by Fuxia Dunhua. This is um, a story to familiarize on the world with the, one of the most sophisticated gastronomic cultures. Um, it's brilliantly presented through the banquet, uh, through a banquet of 30 Chinese dishes. This is, uh, Chinese was earliest, was the earliest truly global cuisine, yet it has a distinction of being one of the world's best loved culinary traditions but one of the least understood. And 
Dunlop is going to explore the history, philosophy, and techniques of Chinese culinary culture. In each chapter, she will examine a classic dish to reveal a distinctive aspect of Chinese gastronomy. Readers experience a weaving together of history, mouth-watering descriptions, and some on-the-ground research that she conducted over the course of three decades in this lively landmark tribute to the pleasures and mysteries of Chinese cuisine. And on my desk is a lovely book. I've described it right here. <laughs> <laughs> it's called The Secret History of Food, um, which is by Matt Siegel. And that is if the history of food is the appeal factor from a cookbook like this. Um, and then I also brought uh, Land of Fish and Rice. Um, and this is, this is also a cookbook um, about China with history and some other uh, detailed, gorgeous, gorgeous photographs of food. Um, so it's a very beautiful uh, cookbook. If you want to call it a cookbook, it seems kind of limiting, right? <laughs> So Elizabeth Grace Hale is a scholar of white supremacy and professor of history and American studies at the University of Virginia. And this book uh, details her investigation into, uh, her, into a family legend, her own family. Her grandfather was a sheriff in rural Mississippi in 1947. And as the family story went, he, he courageously protected a black man accused of rape from a mob. What she discovers is that he was actually complicit in the man's lynching the day afterward. It's a courageous, painful, and compelling account about obsession, injustice, and the historical record. I also brought uh, By Hands Now Known by Margaret Burnham. This is a paradigm-shifting investigation of Jim Crow era violence, the legal apparatus that sustained it, and its enduring legacy from a renowned legal scholar. And The Lynching by Lawrence Lemer describes the brutal killing of a, black, of a young black man in 1981 in Alabama, and the courtroom battle that ultimately bankrupted the Ku Klux Klan. Elvis and the Colonel by Greg McDonald. This is, quote, a fresh biography of legendary entertainment manager Colonel Tom Parker with a contrarian and corrective point of view. So, uh, Colonel Tom Parker, whose most famous client was, as you can see, Elvis Presley. Uh, it's often rumored uh, that Parker took advantage of Elvis, who signed with Parker when he was just a teenager, and that Parker, you know, basically mismanaged him throughout his career. But the author of this book, uh, Greg McDonald, who, who was an insider who worked for Parker for years, uh, aims to dispel this uh, perception. The book covers the, the details of Parker's early life in the Netherlands, his migration to the U.S., his stints with the Army and the Humane Society, his time working in circuses and carnivals, and his eventual innovations made during his time with Elvis. It's an addictive behind-the-scenes account. If you want more about the Colonel and his relationship with Elvis, you can check out the Colonel. And I had to chuckle to myself because the description of this one is a biography of Tom Parker that shows he was, quote, a certified psychopath. <laughs> so, if you want the other side of the story, this is the one to check out. If you're more into Elvis proper, you can check out Being Elvis by Ray Connolly. Uh, this is a biography that covers his life, including, of course, his relationship with Tom Parker. And last but not least, a wonderful, powerful new memoir. Um, Raquel, the author, was one of the speakers at the National Women's March podium just after the election of Trump in 2017. And while her time was cut short, it inspired her more to speak for marginalized communities. She was born in Augusta, Georgia to Catholic parents and felt isolated for years, even when surrounded by close family. She had little understanding of the LGBTQ plus community and questioned her gender and sexuality. There were years of confusion, luckily, fortunately for her, followed by years of growth and support when she made it to the University of Georgia. She spent years in the closet as a journalist until the epidemic of violence against people of color and trans people has motivated her to be out and loud and proud and a helpful ally. She shares her story of politics and transformation 
to motivate others to take risks and not shy away from life's complexities. There's a lot of really interesting um, memoirs about um, from people in the Black Lives Matter community, Black Lives Matter community, and the LGBTQ community. Um, so I tried to go a different route with it. This Congratulations, The Best is Over by R. Eric Thomas. It's a wonderful collection of essays, and he is a uh, gay black man who writes about his overcoming experience, but in a really fun, enlightening, year long for the last kind of way. Um, this one, The Young and the Restless, The Girls Who Sparked America's Revolutions, is in process, so it's here in the library, it's just getting stickered and stuff, so you can be the first to read it uh, if you ask for it at the desk here. Um, this one is the untold history of teenage females moving along some of America's most important social movements. Before Rosa Parks and Make Room Susan B. Anthony, from the workers' rights to walkouts to women's liberation and school strikes for climate, um, get to know some of these compassionate and illuminating new stories of our history. So, I think that is it. The next book is in focus. Hopefully we'll see you on November 14th and the you know, book show and tell in two weeks from now. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you.